Matthew, the seventh chapter, is uh, continuing on in the Sermon on the Mount. We will look at some passages today and have one more Sunday looking at the Sermon on the Mount. We've kind of taken bigger passages. The last couple of weeks we talked about Jesus and His comments about prayer. Today we're going to talk about Jesus and some comments about just everyday relationships. In fact, there's the phrase that we hear, can't we all just get along? Truth is, I really don't think we can. You see, the problem is that getting along means that my sinful spirit, my sinful nature, and your sinful nature, and the sinful nature of all the other people in the world are going to be in conflict most of the time. So the truth is that just getting along is not always going to be easy. In fact, there are two basic worldviews. One of them says human beings are just fine. They're good, basically, deep down inside. And if they just had enough education, if they had good health care, if they had all the basic things in life, if we just had a few more things in their favor, then everything would just turn out great. That's not the Christian biblical worldview. The biblical worldview is that we are sinners. And that left to our own devices, we will live in sin and in chaos. And what we desperately need is a Savior who is Jesus Christ. So the reality is that you and I live in a world filled with sinners. And Paul said of who he was chief. The truth is that all of us are sinners. And that makes relationships complicated. The truth is, I really can't control how other people behave. But I can control how I behave. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives some pretty solid advice for how you and I, in a world of sinful people, need to conduct ourselves, and that's what we can do. So, some of the most familiar passages we hear from Jesus about judging and not judging, about the golden rule, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, those are parts of the Sermon on the Mount. So beginning in chapter 7, verse 1, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Now, by the way, that gets life really complicated because we've just been told not to judge, and now we're told there are some folks that you just need to not give good things to, and I assume you have to make a judgment about that, but we'll get there. Then if you jump over to verse 12, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Well, judge not lest you be judged. By the way, I hear that a lot. People quote that a lot. Normally they're quoting it when they feel like somebody is disapproving of their behavior and they don't want to be judged, and so they love to quote that. The reality is deep down inside, we all do have to sometimes make judgments of some sort. We do form opinions about other people, and sometimes we really have no choice. I did a wedding yesterday, and, you know, the couple was in my office, and it's kind of like, why in the world would you want to marry him? Well, of course, then I always go the other way, and then it's always mushy. Well, we love each other. and that's, uh, uh, Well, this couple, they'd, they'd known each other for six years, so they knew a whole lot about each other, and And they had come to the conclusion, they'd made an opinion, they'd made a judgment, that's the person I want to marry. If you're in business, 
And you ever have to hire somebody, you do the interview, you do background checks, you get all the information, and then you make a judgment about whether or not you think they'll be a good employee. If you go to see a doctor and they want to operate on you, you have to determine, my judgment is that he knows what he's talking about and I trust him, or take my car. The, the reality is every day we do make some kinds of judgments. As much as anything, what Jesus is saying, you and I need to be very careful about the way that we make those judgments. In particular, we need to really guard against being critical and negative and harsh in our judgments of other people. And there's a variety of different reasons. First of all, you're not God. God is the ultimate judge. God is the perfect judge. And judgment ultimately belongs to God. So that when we make our opinions and when we deal with other people, we need to be very careful that we don't try to take the place of God. For instance, one of the, uh, the issues about judging others is that we're so prone to pride that for us, many times, judgment takes the position of looking down on other people. Assuming that somehow we're better than them, somehow we're, we're superior and we look in a negative way at others and see ourselves and literally there's nothing there but arrogance. And God is the one who we must all be underneath. We also know that there's a problem with prejudice. Prejudice is ultimately pre-judging someone and truthfully it's on limited information. You see, the thing about God is God knows everything about us. So when God does His judgment, when He judges us in the day of, of judgment, He knows everything about us. He knows every detail. He can look at us and He can see what's inside our hearts, what's inside our minds. He knows more about us. The problem is when you and I make judgments, it's almost always with limited information. That's why we think about prejudging. Well, I see the color of your skin, so therefore I know everything about you. Well, we know that's not true. I see where you're from, your ethnic background. I know everything about you. I see what kind of bumper sticker you have on your car and, and who you support or who you root for, and therefore I somehow know everything about you. And the truth is we are warned because we do not have that perfect information. There is something about needing to see and to know and on limited information. In fact, sometimes even just in a single instance, we have a, a, a little interlude with an individual and it doesn't go well and so immediately we form a negative situation. This week I had to make a, an appointment with a doctor, kind of dealt, had to deal with a, a, frankly, a really rude lady on the phone. She just was not very nice. She just was condescending and rude and, and my very first thought is, I think I'm going to call her boss and tell her because he just... She, and then it was just the danger of preaching on this sermon ahead of time. And God kind of said, okay, so how much do you really know about this lady? Well, I knew about a 35-second conversation in which she said some things. And I have no idea what her day was like or what the person she'd talked to before had said or what she'd maybe learned from her physician or what else was going on. And he just sort of came down, yep, yeah, you ought to not be judging her too harsh because you really don't know anything about her life at all. The danger of prejudice is that it sort of puts us in the place of God as if we know everything that God knows about a person, and truthfully, we never do. But maybe the greatest thing about it is that uh, when it comes to judging, normally it's we look at the flaws and the faults in someone else's life, and Jesus makes it really clear that you and I are not perfect either. It's kind of in the Sermon on the Mount, this is the comic relief moment where Jesus is telling this sermon that's really harsh and strict and hard, and then he says, oh, and by the way, it's like you looking at somebody else's eye trying to take a piece of sawdust out of their eye when you got a board out of your eye. Well, that's, you know, you can just picture all the people in the crowd sitting around, saying, ha, ha, yeah, that's pretty silly. Some of them probably knew that he was a carpenter at one time in his life and had made a lot of sawdust over his life, but this idea that it's so absurd that you and I should look at the faults in somebody else when we obviously have so many faults in our own. We have folks in our church who have done remarkably over the years in overcoming certain addictions, Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know if you know much, and I, I think they still do this. When you go to that kind of a meeting, the way you introduce yourself is, my name is, and I'm an alcoholic. 
Then they will go on to say, and I've not had anything to drink for 20 years. I've not had a thing to drink for seven years and eight months and 16 days. And they'll go on to say that, but they still will always begin with the idea that I am an alcoholic. It's kind of the thing that if they're going to be helpful to one another, they each have to admit their own shortcomings. It's kind of like the idea for you and I to say, my name is Roger Marshall and I'm a sinner. And by the way, my last sin was not 20 years ago, maybe not even 20 minutes ago, but I'm a sinner. And the truth is that occasionally we do need to help one another. We need to sometimes talk to loved ones and people that we care about, about things that are going on in their life or maybe decision choices they're making. But it's always easier if you and I come, not from a position of superiority, but as a fellow sinner who has struggled in my own life. That's what this passage is. That yes, love is not blind and we see the faults of the people that we love and sometimes we have to talk to them, but there's this simple sense and what this really comes down to is that people saved by grace ought to be gracious with everyone they meet. People who have been forgiven great amounts of sin ought to be quick to forgive the sins of others. People who have experienced the mercy of Jesus ought to be merciful with one another. And that's part of this reality. And, and truthfully, we understand that not everybody will be that way to us. But Jesus says, if you're going to live in this world, this is the way you need to treat people. Then he goes on to this other really hard passage. And he says, okay, you're not supposed to be judging others harshly. You're not supposed to be judging other difficult people because there's some consequences. And one of the consequences is that if you judge people that way, they're going to judge you that way. Kind of little, there, uh, Karen and I live in a little cul de sac that has five houses in it. Two of them have been for sale and have sold this week. Uh, the rest of us are wondering if we didn't do deodorant or didn't keep our yard nice enough. Everybody's lubing on us. But, but in this process, there were people coming to look at these other houses. And I was out in the yard a week ago, and a guy stopped in a pickup truck and rolled his window down and he said, We're looking at this house. What kind of people live in this neighborhood? I wasn't really sure how to answer that question. I, my initial thought was the really nice ones are moving out. Uh, the, the ones that are left, you're kind of stuck with. And, it, and so we had a little conversation and talked about some of the folks that live in my neighborhood. And there's some challenges, some of the people they're related to. But, uh, but it reminded me there's an old story. I think it's a Greek story of a time of transition where people were moving because of earthquakes or something. And, and there was at a, at a village a gate and a gatekeeper, and somebody came and stopped, and they asked that question, what kind of people live in this village? And the gatekeeper said, what kind of people were in the village where you came from? And the person said, well, they weren't very nice. They were mean, and they weren't good neighbors, and we didn't trust them. In fact, frankly, we're just glad to be moving. It's a, this wasn't a very good place. And the gatekeeper said, I hate to tell you, but that's the kind of people that live here. So they moved on. Then a bit later, another family came by and they said, what kind of people live in this town? And he said, well, what kind of people live where you came from? Oh, they were our best friends. We hated to have to leave. Some of our best friends, we loved our neighbors. We got along. Everybody helped one another. And, and the gatekeeper said, that's exactly the kind of people in this village. You're welcome. And opened the gate and they came on in. Well, this idea of this judgmental spirit, this critical nature, and frankly, you all know people like that. In fact, sometimes you may even know that you have a tendency to that. And all of us in certain areas sometimes have that sense to be negative and critical and to focus on the flaws of other people. But understand, Jesus said, if that's the measure and the way you're going to treat others, assume that it's going to come back to you. But maybe even worse is if you treat others that way, there seems to be a suggestion that God is not going to be as gracious to us. Now, we know He's going to be gracious, but in the Sermon on Mount, the, the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses, how? As we forgive those who trespass against us. So this idea of being gracious with one another is vitally important. And I can't tell you that they'll always be gracious back, and you can forgive, and they won't forgive you, and you can be nice, and not everybody will be nice, but you can control the way you live. Now, he does go on to say that there are some times when you are gracious to people and you give them the very best that you have and you give them the gospel, you give the holy things of God, you give them these really good things that come from Christ, 
and sometimes they will trample on them. And sometimes you may have to back off from some individuals, and that's a tough thing to do. It's a, it's a dangerous thing. You remember Jesus even told his disciples as they were going out by twos, you're going to get to some places and people aren't going to receive you, and they're not going to receive your message. And he said, shake off the dust of your feet, and you may have to go on. You don't get angry and you don't get mean. In fact, there was another scenario of that when Jesus was actually sharing the gospel and nobody was responding. I think it was in the Decapolis on the Jordan side. And, and he was preaching and nobody was responding. And, uh, and one of the disciples just said, well, Jesus, if they're not responding, should we just call down fire from heaven and just destroy all those people? And I believe Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you are supposed to be of. Sometimes people won't treat you well. And sometimes you don't need to keep giving them more grace and you don't have to be taken advantage of and you don't have to be hurt. But at some point, you step away, but even then you do it gracefully. He then goes on to what we call the golden rule. And despite what some people think, the golden rule is not people who have the gold make the rules. Sometimes it's that way, some places. But the golden rule is just pretty basic. In fact, it says, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. There's another time when Jesus uses that phrase. When he gives the two great commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Upon those two hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, pretty much everything he was saying in the Old Testament, those 39 books, can be summed up in that. So Jesus says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And there's two sides. There's a negative side. In other words, if you don't want people to hurt you, don't hurt anybody else. I think there's a medical thing, probably with doctors, but one of the first rules of medicine is do no harm. I mean, try and help people, but even if you can't help them, and in the process of helping them, don't hurt them. Don't do any kind of harm to them. There is something about being harmless as we go through the world. I hate to say it, but there are some Christians who have... I, the way I've heard it this way, have all the tack of a Mack truck. They just kind of blurt into places and into circumstances and in their homes and in their families. They just say whatever they feel like and they do whatever they feel like and they really don't ever think about the fact that their words and their actions affect every single person that they come across. To do unto others begins with the idea that you understand that everything you do affects somebody else. And a lot of people say, that's my life, I can do whatever I want, I'm, I'm, I'll just live any way I want. Well, that's fine, but everything you do still affects somebody else. So don't hurt anybody. But more than that, if you want somebody to be a blessing to you someday, then you need to be intentional about being a blessing for someone else. It's just a different way of living. And you do understand that if you were to live this way, if you were to be gracious and forgiving and loving to people, no matter who they are and what they do, and if you were to treat them in a way that you would want to be treated, if you do that, you will stand out and be different. And Jesus goes on eventually to say, so what you have to do, the people who were listening to the sermon 2,000 years ago, and the people listening today, is you've got to decide what kind of person do you want to be. And he paints the picture. He says, there's a gate. And there's a big gate. It's a wide gate. It's, it's a huge gate. And it's easy to get through. There's plenty of room. And most of the people in the world go through that gate. But he says, the problem is, if that's the gate you choose, it leads to destruction. And then he says, there's another gate. Only it's kind of small. And it's kind of hard to get through, and it's not going to be easy, and, and it's going to be a challenge, and it'll be difficult. But if you go through that gate, that's the gate that takes you to life. Life worth living in this world, life in the world to come, that's the different gate. And he says you got to choose. So partly it's, it's interesting that at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he's just getting started. And he's preaching this sermon to huge crowds along the Sea of Galilee. And he says, you all got to decide if you're going to follow me or not, but i got to tell you, Following me and living the way I want you to live is different than the rest of the world. And it's not going to be easy. 
And when it comes to dealing with people in a sinful world and dealing with folks at work and in your family and your neighborhoods and other people, when you're dealing with people, it's complicated, it's challenging. But if you trust me and you'll be gracious and you'll be loving and you'll be kind and you'll be sensitive and you'll take all of these things that I've said into account, it won't be easy, but it'll be better. And it'll be complicated, but it'll be blessed. And you won't be like the rest of the world. And the rest of the world won't appreciate it. And the rest of the world may not even understand it, but in the end, you're going to go where you want to go. Hadn't been too many years ago, I was coming back from the hospital in St. Louis and uh, was kind of, you all know I practice my sermons in the car. I I preach to myself in the car. Um, Have great, great attendance. Everybody shows up who's supposed to be there when I'm there, you know, attendance of one. And I was just driving along, and everything was going great, and all of a sudden I looked up, and there was a sign that said, Springfield, five miles. That that was not the right road. You know, there's a little thing where 70 and 55 kind of, I don't even know still to this day how it happened, but I was not on the right road. I'd kind of, yep, that didn't work out very well, so I took a scenic route. I grew up near Hillsboro. It wasn't too bad. I kind of cut through the country, and only took about an hour and 30 minutes more to get home than it should have. But sometimes this idea of choosing which road you want to walk on, where are you going to go? And the truth is sometimes without even paying attention, we find ourselves just sort of wake up and, boy, I'm awfully bitter. I'm awfully critical. I'm awfully quick to judge. I I say things about other people. Sometimes we just need to say, That's not the kind of road, that's not the kind of person I want to be. I want to come over here. And I want to be more gracious, and I want to be more caring and forgiving and understanding. And Jesus says, that's the choice for life. So today, as this sermon kind of starts wrapping up, Jesus says, it's time to decide what kind of person. And if you're going to follow Him, it means you're going to treat people with the grace that He gives to us. Let's stand and let's sing.